So this has been a momentous week for science with the discovery of the Higgs, which I personally think is the greatest discovery in physics for the last 80 years. And I'm delighted in this session to welcome Professor Rob Hoyer, who is the Director General of CERN, to Ireland and, and to this conference as well. Now this talk was organised about a year ago, and in December last year, Rolf went on record very bravely as saying that we would find the Higgs by the end of this year. But I said to him, you correct me, but I said, can't you hurry it up a bit, because we had this wonderful conference in Dublin. And uh, he did his best, and he came in a, a week ahead, and so, so here we are, so that's fantastic. Now, I'm not going to give you a potted bio of, of Rolf, because you can read that in the programme, but what I would like to say is that, from my experience working at CERN, that the discovery of the Higgs is due in no small part to Rolf's leadership. So we have to work on the subject to be able to say that, I think, to know what goes on. But he's provided an environment at CERN that is second to none in the world. It really allows scientists and engineers from all over the world to work together and collaborate effectively. So this discovery is really a, a global discovery. And, and for that, I'd like to personally thank him, and, as well as introduce him to you to speak today. So Rob Hoyer, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Roman, for this very kind introduction. The search for a deeper understanding of our universe at the Large Hadron Collider, the world's largest particle accelerator, well, unfortunately, I can't spare you. You will now get a lecture on particle physics, which means afterwards you are experts on particle physics. But before I do that, I just have one transparency on the mission of CERN. What is the mission of CERN? The mission of CERN is fourfold. Research, it's clear, it's our raison d'etre, why CERN was founded. You cannot do research without innovation. You cannot do research without education and training, and you cannot do it alone. And therefore, CERN is an ideal place to unite people. Science is a, uni is a, is a universal language, and this we speak at CERN. We leave politics out, we speak science. So, in the research, we want to push forward the frontiers of knowledge. We want to understand the beginning of the universe. How did all this happen? That, that we want to find out, and that is what is intriguing us. In order to do that, we have to develop new technologies for accelerators, for detectors, and also for information technology. And you might wonder why I have the web here. Yeah? I mean, people who are below 20, they have never seen the world without the web. They might think the web was created at the Big Bang. <laughs> this is not true. <laughs> the web was born in 1989 when our experiments became so global, so international, that we needed a software platform to make information available to everybody all over the world who had the right to access it. That was the birth of the web. We train scientists and engineers of tomorrow, and every country needs scientists and engineers of tomorrow. And I think this is a key message. You need more scientists, more engineers to keep the world stable, to keep a good world, and to keep science in society. So this is absolutely important. And as I said, we unite people from different countries and cultures. We have, I think, 99 nationalities registered at CERN. So this is a, it's a fantastic environment, and a, a very nice environment. Okay. So, to the, one of today's scientific challenges, to understand the very first moments of the Big Bang. Yeah? From the Big Bang, when the universe was hot, spot-like, point-like, tremendously hot, and then it expanded over roughly four, 14 billion years, until we are, where we are today, in a rather, rather cool universe, and from zero to 10 to the 28 centimeters. I don't know. I don't know what 10 to the 28 centimeters mean. It's very large. Maybe it helps you if you replace the centimeter by dollars. <laughs> you have roughly the, uh, the square of the American deficit. <laughs> it only helps me to understand that the deficit is pretty large. Okay, so it's very difficult to understand these, or to imagine these sizes. So here you have it on a ruler from the Big Bang to today, from essentially 0 to 10 to the 28. As difficult as it is to 
imagine the large scales, it's also difficult to imagine the small scales. From a certain scale, all everything for me is roughly like zero. Yeah? So it's very difficult to imagine. But mathematically and in the development of the universe, it's a huge difference between these different digits. What we can imagine is usually the, the human size or close to the human size and who in the audience knows who that is? <laughs> it's Ernest Walton. And the Irish people should not forget that Ernest Walton was a famous scientist and one of the key persons in the accelerator business. Yeah? Cock of Walton. Yes? So you should not forget and you should not downplay your influence on that. Okay. So, how to study the universe? Well, we can look into the large scales. With space-based space -based telescopes or ground-based telescopes, we can look into the history of the universe. But we don't come closer to the Big Bang as roughly 400,000 years, because the universe was so hot that photons could not escape. They were always ionizing the atoms which tried to, to form. So 400,000 years, which is pretty close to the Big Bang. You can also go to the small scales. Now here you need a super microscope, and the Large Hadron Collider is nothing else than a super microscope. Okay, and with this super microscope, you come down to distances like 10 to the minus 16 centimeters, or in time, you come as close as one millionth of a millionth of a second. Nobody else comes closer to the, to the Big Bang than we with our super microscope. This is in human terms, a very, very short distance, a very, very short time. However, in the timing of the universe, tremendous amount has happened in these millions of a millions of a second. So we still have a lot to explore there. Okay, what is the role of accelerators? Well, if you want to resolve the inner structure of matter, you need to resolve very <laughs> tiny objects. In order to resolve very tiny objects, you need small wavelengths. So you have to have a high resolution power. Unfortunately, small wavelengths means large energy. There's nothing about it. You need large energy. But with this large energy, according to Einstein, you also have the chance to produce new particles with high masses. So the high energy gives you a high resolution power and higher mass new particles. This is the nice thing at the accelerators. And when you produce new particles, for example, you can produce them in high statistics. That means you can do precision measurements. Cosmic rays have also high energies, but very low statistics. So you cannot do really high precision measurements. Okay, so when we study the physics law of the first moments after the Big Bang, we have a symbiosis between the smallest particle physics, the largest, which is astrophysics and cosmology. And this is the intriguing thing today. I mean, this is a fantastic science field which really spans the smallest to the largest and this, which gives you information about the early universe. Okay, so what have we learned over the last hundred years? Well, rather 401 years ago, I told you that you are essentially all empty. You might not realize this, but it's cool. Because the atoms are dividable, so they, they have the nucleus, the, the nuclei, and then the electrons around it. Now the nuclei are built out of protons and neutrons, and these protons and neutrons in turn are built up out of quarks and gluons. So they are composite objects. So we have come from an atom, atom was at that time to the new atom was, namely the quarks, gluons and the electrons, which are point-like <laughs> particles. These are the smallest constituents of matter. And now let's look into that, what we have learned here. It took us roughly 50 years to establish the status of the standard model. The physical world is composed of quarks and leptons. And you see it here, three families of two quarks and two leptons each. So the first family here is the up and down quark, and the two leptons are the electron and its neutrino. And that's enough. You all consist only of these three particles. And me too, of course, but... <laughs> up quark, down quark, and the electron. That's all. That's all we need to, 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 to form us. That's enough. Now nature has decided to make a second family, charm and strange quark and muon and uh, muon neutrino, and even a third family. And the only difference between the three families is that the corresponding partners here in the, in, along the lines are heavier and heavier. So the top quark is the heaviest elementary particle we know. It's a point-like particle, and it, it's as heavy as a gold atom. Fantastic. Now we don't know why we have three families. We don't know why the masses are so different in these three families. So we know a lot, but we also know nothing about these things. So this is but it's fantastic here. That's the periodic system of the microcosm. 
12 entries. It's much easier than chemistry. <laughs> you only have to know 12 of these things. Plus, you, of course, these meta particles have to exchange forces. They have to know which forces come from the other particles. And these forces are interchanged, mediated by bosons, by gauge bosons, by the force carriers, the photon for the electromagnetic force, the gluons for the strong force and the ZW for the weak force. The graviton we can neglect because gravitation is so so weak in the microcosm that we can fortunately ne neglect it. So that's all we, we need to know about the particles, that means the, the force particles and the metal particles, plus of course the corresponding antiparticles. 85 years ago, Iraq introduced antimatter, which was then 80 years ago discovered. And particles and antiparticles are always created in pairs. You see, according to Einstein, E equals C squared, you produce out of the energy always particle and antiparticle. But also, when they meet again, they annihilate each other. So mass goes back to energy. That means there's a question. Why are we at all here? Because at the beginning, matter and antimatter were produced or created in equal quantities. Now, in equal quantities means they annihilate again and we put all the energy. But nature has introduced a very small asymmetry in the behavior between matter and antimatter. So that there's, at the end, one part in 10 billion more matter than antimatter. And this one part in 10 billion, this tiny distortion is sitting here and standing here. That's it. Because there is no sign of antimatter in the universe. So we are a matter-dominated universe. That's one of the big questions. How did that happen? So, that was the static model of the, the static behavior of the, the static model of the, of, the, of the universe. The standard model of the particle physics is now a mathematical formalism which describes all the interaction between these particles through the weak, the electromagnetic, and the strong forces. And we have tested this model with a very, very high precision. Yeah? Down to a size of 10 to the minus 18 meters, or energy wise up to 100 GeV. And this beast withstands all these tests. It's fantastic. It's great. It's really a fantastic achievement. And I have now one transparency where I show for the scientists the achievement. That's here. Don't worry too much. These are 17 quantities which you can measure, for example. Now, if the quantity is exactly in its measurement on the value which is predicted by the standard model, then the point is at zero. If it is a normalized error, one normalized error away, then it's here. Two normalized errors away, three normalized errors away. And you always have measurement errors. So you have a distribution of measurement errors. And you expect something like this. You expect more which are below one, a few which are between one and two, and from time to time one which is between two and three. This is absolutely normal. Actually, without this point here, which is deviating three normalized uh, errors away, without this, fit, this uh, without, without this point, the fit would be too good. You need that. Yeah? So, I told you, it's a fantastic achievement. On the other hand, it's absolutely frustrating because there's one cornerstone missing within the standard model, or at least until a week ago. I soon have to change the whole talk. <laughs> And this is a question, what is the origin of mass of elementary particles? Because the standard model as it was introduced originally was only valid for massless particles. But we know the particles have one mass. And then you need a second formalism, which you plug into the first one. And with this second formalism, you make the standard model valid also for massive particles. And this was Mr. Higgs, the physicist Higgs, plus others, introduced this second mechanism, and this second me mechanism can be explained as follows. Mass is not only a question of, of weight, it's also a question of velocity with, with, with which you move once you have a certain energy. If you have, this is my last equation, by the way. If you have a mass, if you have a mass zero, then you move with a velocity of light all the time. If you have a heavy mass, and you're moving more slowly. And the heavier you are with the same energy, you move more and more slowly. So the higher the mass, the lower the velocity. 
So what these guys did, they introduced a field, a scalar field. A scalar field is a field which has no preferred direction. How can I make this a bit clearer? Um, if you swim in a river, that depending on which direction you swim, the force of the water is different on you. Yeah? So that means this is a vector. If you swim in a, swimming in a, in a large swimming pool, then the force of the water is everywhere the same, independent in which direction you swim. That's a scalar. Okay? So, they introduce a scalar field, and the particles which move through the scalar field, they acquire mass through their interaction with this field. And the stronger their interaction with this field is, the more massive they are. And this field has a peculiarity. It can interact with itself. It's difficult to a swimming pool, but it can do that. And the self-interaction of the field, this is the famous Higgs particle. This is a signal that this field is existent or not. Okay. This is a Higgs field. <laughs> or, another, or it's a party of journalists. Cocktail party. They are all equally distributed in the room. I come in here. I want to go through here massless. That means with the velocity of light. That's easy because they don't know me. So I, I'm full. <laughs> but then somebody comes in, whom they know. <laughs> what happens? They cluster around him. They cluster. Oh, sit. Excuse me. They cluster around him. He acquires mass. Yeah? He's hindered in his velocity. The more known that person is to the journalist, the more journalists are around him, the more massive that person gets. Yeah? So this is the way a particle gets mass in the Higgs field. How to explain the Higgs boson? Well, suppose I open the door and I whisper a rumor into the room. The journalists, of, are, of course, are curious. What did he say? That's the self-interaction of the journalist or the self-interaction of the Higgs field, and this is a Higgs photo. <laughs> so... <laughs> particle physics is really easy. Okay, now we know the Higgs particle is the last missing cornerstone you see the standard model. And we know everything about it. The only thing we did not know is that it exists. <laughs> Slight problem. But maybe we have solved it, but I will come back to that. Okay. But this standard model has leaves many, many questions open. For example, can we unify the forces? This is here the, the energy scale. Here's, here's a big bang roughly. And the standard model, these are the dash curves, cannot unify the forces at the high, at the high energy. So if you introduce a model which is beyond the standard model, then you can unify the form. The standard model doesn't tell anything what happened to antimatter. It doesn't tell us in how many space or time dimensions we are living. And it has not the faintest clue what is dark matter, what is dark energy. And the LHC will address most of these questions. So it goes much beyond the Higgs particle. In particular, it will address the question of the dark matter and dark energy. Because the standard model nearly just doesn't explain it, describes 4 to 5 percent of the matter energy density in the universe, the visible universe. The 95 percent are dark. One quarter of it is dark matter, which clumps and keep, tries to keep the universe together and shape the universe at the beginning of its existence. Three quarters of it is dark energy, which drives the universe apart. We know very little about dark matter. We know essentially nothing about dark energy. But I think with the Large Hadron Collider, we are now entering the dark universe. And this is fantastic in the next year. So the Large Hadron Collider. I think it's one of the largest instruments ever built, 27 kilometers of circumference here in the nice region of Geneva, 100 meters underground. More than 10,000 people involved in design, construction, and now exploitation. It collides protons, that means the nuclei of the hydrogen, to study the very beginning of the universe, and that we do 40 million times a second. It's quite often. 
So how do we do this? Well, we have in this tunnel two pipes in the magnets, the blue and the red one. In both pipes, we accelerate protons, two beams of protons in bunches. Yeah, each uh, we have bunches of protons. So here are 100 billion protons are in each of these packets. And these 100 billion protons, they are in one packet are brought to a collision at four points. And in these collisions, sometimes the protons collide, but the protons are composite particles. So it's not the protons which are important, it's the quarks or the gluons out of these protons which are interacting, getting the, the, the rid of their energy, so you have an energy spot, and then out of this energy, new particles come out, and we have to measure these new particles with our experiment. This is how it was built. This is one of these 15 meter long magnets, brought down, and then in the tunnel, brought to its uh, place where it should be installed, then being installed, aligned, and then you have 10,000 of these high current, 15,000 amperes, uh, high current connections, which have to be raised uh, and soldered. And then afterwards it looks like this, and this is how I like to see it, because then you can take data, then it's ready to go. It's one of the coldest places in the universe. Because these 27 kilometers are driven at superfluid temperature, superfluid helium, 1.9 Kelvin above, uh, above zero. The outer space is 2.7. So we have the largest refrigerator in the world. At the same time, it's one of the hottest places in the galaxy. Because at the collision of the protons, we produce temperatures which are much, much higher than those in the center of the sun. How can that happen? Well. If a proton hits another proton, that's like a mosquito in full fly hitting another mosquito in full fly. You agree with me, there's two mosquitoes hitting each other, you don't come very close to the big bang. What's the key? The key is that these protons are tiny, tiny, tiny particles. So the energy density, that means the energy divided by the area of the protons is huge. And this is this energy density which brings you so close to the big bang. Okay. So, the design energy is 7 on 7 TeV. Today we run at a bit more than half of this energy, 8 TeV. We have 1,400 of these packets running clockwise, 1,000 running anti-clockwise, colliding at four points. That means we have at the moment a 20 megahertz crossing rate. <coughs> and we have a luminosity, which means the probability of collisions per second, which is already today beyond the design value. Now imagine such a huge efficient, huge collider, which is a new thing, which is a prototype in itself. After two years of running, you exceed your design value. I'm not sure if any other accelerator did this so quickly. I mean, it's fantastic. Okay, and you have many, many interactions per second, per crossing per second, so you have 10 to the 9, that means, I think it's a billion, billion proton interactions per second. In each collision, you produce it's many hundred charged particles. It's an enormous challenge for the detectors to read, to see that, yeah? To, to take the pictures of that and to collect the data, to store the data and to analyze the data. Okay, so 2010, when we really started, we entered a new era in fundamental science. Four big experiments and three very small ones. And you might wonder why four experiments. Well, we have two general purpose detectors, CMS and Atlas. <coughs> and a message to everybody, never believe a scientific result which comes only from one group. It always has to be cross-checked. It's very, very important. And this is also why we have, fortunately, two of these general purpose detectors which are supposed to record everything which is interesting. Then we have a specialized detector to study d -quarks. Our chairman is part of this. Uh, experiment, that means doubling this part of the experiment here. This is studying the question, where is antimatter gone? Yeah? So this is addressing the question of the difference between matter and antimatter. And finally, ALICE, which is a specialized detector to study not the proton collisions, but from time to time, one month per year, we collide lead ions in order to create uh, or produce the very hot, dense matter short moment after the Big Bang, and they study that one for this matter. <coughs> but there's overlap in physics reach between 
between the specialized and the general purpose experiments, some particles can live a bit longer and they leave traces a little bit longer. And the speciality is to find these heavy particles which live a little bit longer because they could be a key to the antimatter question. And LHCB does this, but also the other experiments can do that. So we have overlap here. And also overlap in physics which with the heavy ion experiments because all, all of these experiments, they can reconstruct, they can see several thousand trajectories in one of these events. Several thousand to reconstruct it, to measure it. And actually now comes at, at half time when always there's a commercial, I think. I put now a commercial in. This here is a book. And you see that's like, the cover is like this. This is a real event. The real event display of one of these, uh, from one of these collisions. This is a book with fantastic photos. I can tell you this is Peter Gitter, a very, very well-known photographer. And I took the trouble to bring a few books here. So if somebody has too much money, <laughs> I'm happy to sell some of these books. Otherwise, I have to take them back. Okay. And I don't think you want to do that to me. Okay. But I can tell you, it's, it's very nice book. And it explains also in layman terms what these things are and how they are made, etc. So it's, uh, it's a nice book. Okay. Over with the commercial. So, the versatility of the LHC and the complementarities of the experiments makes the whole of LHC much more than the sum of its parts. So these four experiments together are much more. Okay, and one of it, I want to show Atlas again. It's one of the largest and most complex detectors, and you see the size here. This is the size of an average physicist or average technician. Okay, some of you got the joke. 20 times 20 times 40 cubic meters. And in the whole volume, the trajectories of the particles are measured with an accuracy roughly like the diameter of the human hair. And the whole volume. Would you agree with me that this is engineering art? What's that? <laughs> you see the eightfold symmetry, you see this fold, you see even these red things here. <laughs> Very similar, isn't it? <laughs> well, this is a stage design of an opera. And I can tell you, Atlas was before. <laughs> so it, it shows you how much interest also from artists is there in our science, in the science, and in the engineering. So this is fantastic to see. And therefore, I have decided a year ago to introduce a new program, not only to collide particles, but also to collide artists and scientists. <laughs> and therefore, we have introduced a new program, Artists in Residence Collide at CERN. And it's amazing. We started this year, and the first program was for digital arts, and we got nearly 400 applications from artists. And the first one came at <coughs> the uh, beginning of the year, and these artists get then assigned in scientific 